Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is our resident Phoenician, Mackenzie. Hello, Patrick. How are you? The kind of joke that makes no sense unless you have a slight unless you're context. Us. <laughs> unless you're us and you're just dumb. Exactly. I, I, I totally accept our dumbness. Uh. Um, so yeah, today we're actually here to both follow up on our previous Irish episode that we had done a few episodes past and to set the final groundwork for Confederation, right? Because next episode, we're actually going to be talking about the Confederation project and how it fully came to be, right? Mm-hmm. Finally! Woo! But, yeah, so today we're going to be specifically talking about a poet, a politician, and an Irish immigrant that kind of coalesces a lot of the ideas that became central to Confederation, right? Wait, are those all the same person? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Darcy McGee was, like, awesome. <laughs> he was, well, okay, let's not over exaggerate, but no. he, was, he was everything. A man of many hats, as one would yes, say. exactly. He was not awesome insofar as, as any 19th century man. I'm sure he had a bunch of problems. Well, I know he had a bunch of problems, but it's kind of impressive that he was able to do a lot of these things. But it's, like, one of the reasons why we're talking about him is exactly that. He kind of advocated for and represents many of what uh, many items of what canada would kind of bring into confederation right as a project as an ideal right and yeah and just in terms of the irishness right he was from ireland it also represents this kind of appropriation of irish culture and just other cultures in general uh, that were reappropriated into the canadian project so that's kind of the one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about Darcy McGee today, rather than as a father of Confederation, which he was, right, and to actually talk about him during the Confederation episodes that we're going to be doing. So obviously, before we get started, we always like to thank our patrons, Craig, Jessica, Elise. And mm-hmm. yeah, thank you for keeping the show going. It helps us it helps us know that, you know, people like what we do and you know, just gives us a little bit of kickback and encourages us to keep going and it supports the sister show that we have over on Patreon, Pop Canada. Woo-hoo. Pop Canada. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really great. So yeah, if you want to support that show and have access to Pop Canada every month, you can support at $3 or you can chuck in a buck or any amount that you feel like. That being said, right, so there's kind of two major aspects that I want to talk about today. Darcy McGee as a person and what he was kind of reacting against and what was one of the major impetuses behind solidifying Confederation, right? Or at least bringing it to fruition because Confederation had been in the talks or in discussion rather within British North America for Mm -hmm. quite a while before it actually happened. Right? But there was really a solidifying element um, that kind of brought it all together and just said, okay, well, now's the time. Right? And that is the Fenians, or the Fenian invasion sometimes, as it's called. Mm-hmm. So classic question, right? Had you ever heard of either the Fenians or Thomas Darcy McGee, or both? These are actually terms, I, like, they're, they, they're tickling the brain a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. They're tickling some sort of, Thomas Darcy McGee especially, I feel like I have at least read maybe a bit of his poetry before mm-hmm. or heard the name, talked about the name just a little bit. Yeah. And then the, the phrase Fenian, like not so much, but again, I, I feel like a phrase that I've either heard or I'm just confusing it with other phrases starting with the first part of Fen. Right. That's, okay. that's also a big uh, possibility. Mm-hmm. It's tickling your Irish sense or whatever. <laughs> I am in fact, I think one sixteenth. Right. That makes sense. At this point, who in Canada is not one sixteenth Irish? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's obviously exaggerating, but like, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> oh, for sure. So yeah, we'll start with the Fenians just because it provides the backdrop for a lot of what we'll be talking about today. And even though we don't address it specifically throughout the episode, I think the Fenians are kind of like an underlying threat, quote unquote. We'll see why I put mm-hmm. the air quotes here throughout this entire discussion and in the decades and years leading up to Confederation. Mm-hmm. So perhaps unsurprisingly to you, Mac, but perhaps to some listeners who might not be aware, Ireland has always had a sketchy relationship with Britain, right? And the <laughs> British Empire. <laughs> Don't, I learned about this from the Captain Amer- uh, Captain Planet episode on it, okay? I know right. all about it. I, As- I, I, lis- I listen to you too. I'm Sunday, <laughs> bloody Sunday. 
<laughs> yeah, that totally uncontroversial figure of Bono. <laughs> oh, Bono. But yeah, no, as, uh, as all good things, we learned about it through Captain Planet. But no, so right, the Irish have kind of had a sketchy relationship with England and the British Great Britain, I guess, for some time ever since they formally started to settle and invade in the 17th century, arguably before, and actually formally merged with Ireland in the 19th century. And obviously it led to all kinds of problems, uh, including later in the 20th, a civil war. So obviously, <laughs> right, just a slight problem, eh? Just a, just a small civil war that... Uh, it's just a civil war. Everybody's had them. I mean, really, at this point, who hasn't? Canada. <laughs> yeah. But we've always been like that. We've always been special. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we can say. Special. Well, okay. We, we, had, we did have a revolution where yes, we attempted no, no. one. That's true. The 1830s, 40s. Yep. yep. Those, those things we talked about over a year ago. Yeah, really. And we've no, only but... moved about 10, 20 years since then. We can actually, we can, we can, I would consider that almost a civil war in some senses. Like it did pit people from a same place against each other, right? Oh, for Ideologically. Sure. So, yeah. Again, Canada has never had a very large pronounced civil war, but we see it again, especially anything concerning Quebec of all places. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, like, considering, again, when we'll get to their way, this will be, like, 10 years down the line when we finally get there, but, you know, 1960s, quiet revolution, so on and so forth. <laughs> we're not going to get there in 10 years. I think we're going to accelerate after Confederation. Honestly, I'm looking at the next episode. It's like, things will, will move forward pretty quickly. Yeah, because you don't, you don't know much about after Confederation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. It's just, like, you can touch upon certain things much more concretely, I think, just because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of groundwork that's set up before. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so the Fenians, right? Fenians kind of embody a specific branch of Irish revolutionaries, right? Um, it was started in 1858 by James Stevens under the name the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood in Dublin. Now, that's not to say that there weren't um, revolutionary movements in Ireland before that. There were many. But as we know the Fenians in that moment, that's when it kind of started. Right? Mm -hmm. And there actually was an American branch of the Fenians that started uh, in the year after, right? And that was started by John O'Mahony. Right? And he's the one who formally named his branch the Fenian Brotherhood. Right. Oh, and yeah. those are that name was inspired by a the name ascribed to warriors of an earlier Irish uh, period, I think from the 1798 revolution, if I remember correctly. And so despite the fact that it was not formally an Irish uh, group right, that had started using the name, Fenian just basically was extrapolated and became a name for Irish nationalist. Right. So I don't... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I just looked it up the term because I'm a bit curious about the history. I didn't find so much the history, but I found what it's used today. Today is a derogatory sectarian term in Ireland referring to Irish nationalists or Catholics, particularly in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me, right? So obviously, just a quick history of the Civil War, right? North versus South. North was generally a bit more Protestant in Irish in Ireland and a bit more pro-British. And Oh, we're talking about the Irish Civil War. Yeah. You said yeah. North and South and Civil War, and my mind was back in the States. Yeah. I mean, right around, no, no. So, like 20, I can't math, 60 years later. Um, yeah. So, no, the Irish Civil War. Sorry. Northern Ireland was generally a bit more Protestant, Southern Ireland a bit more Catholic, or what we now know today as the Republic of Ireland. And so, yeah, that actually kind of makes sense that the Fenians or the more revolutionary ones, the ones that did become the Republic of Ireland, would be considered a derogatory term by Protestants. Um, but yeah, at the time, I it, it's kind of hard to say whether it was a specifically derogatory term. Obviously, it could be used by detractors of the movement as such, but that was also just the name that they used for themselves. <laughs> so... The general goal of, Ireland, uh, of the Fenians was to drive Britain from Ireland. But it's kind of funny that you know, the American branch, at least here, became much more well-known. Right? Um, today, if you speak to anyone in Canada or most people in Canada, I feel like it's an, like a part of history that people are aware of. Um, Ireland? Like the Fenians. Oh. Right? And if you say Fenians, most people won't associate it directly with Ireland, but will associate it with Irish people from America coming up to Well, if Canada. you know the word Fenian and you've sort of had any sort of degree of studying Canadian yeah, yeah. history. Exactly, right? So 
essentially uh, many of the, these Irish revolutionaries or Irish Republicans would be actually taken into the Union Army during the American Civil War. And they would actually get kind of quote unquote formal training with military weapons within that <laughs> system. Um, which is kind of funny and sets the groundwork for a lot of what would happen later when from roughly 1866 to 1871, so right around Confederation, the Athenians would launch several armed attacks on Canada. Now, the scope okay. of these was very varied, but the actual goal was very much like this idea that Canada embodies the British Empire in North America. And obviously it very much did at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so for these Irish Republicans who were in America, it made sense to launch an attack. Now, whether or not they ever actually had a chance is subject to historical debate. But um, the goal was to kind of send a message of saying, like, we represent the Irish here in North America and the British are invaders. Right? Mm -hmm. The British are uh, doing horrible things to Irish people back home. And yeah, we, we don't like it. And even, right, a lot of the Irish were facing persecution in North America. So it kind of incited them to take up arms and attack many areas, namely here in Quebec in the Eastern Townships, in New mm -hmm. Brunswick. It was one of its last major campaigns. Um, take up arms. Absolutely. And yeah, we'll get into like what the actual aftermath and legacy of these raids were, but there were a few throughout the years, right? And it was genuinely a concern for a lot of politicians and people at the time, especially the ones living on the border, which was most people. So, do you have any questions about the Fenians themselves? Um, name every Fenian. Every single one. Okay. Patrick O'Mahony. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> I shot in the dark here. <laughs> I was trying to see O'Henry McDonald's. <laughs> Oh, Mally. I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, generally, um, that's, that kind of sets the groundwork for who the Fenians were. Now, kind of shifting our scope here and right, dialing back the clock from 1866, oh, we find... so close! <laughs> don't worry. By the end of the episode, we'll be back to that time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Thomas Darcy McGee, right? So, McGee himself, a uh, poet... Uh, like I said, politician, general right activist in terms of right that people's uh, rights. Uh, I'm just going to bring it back a bit because I'm looking over the notes now. You got to wonder if the Irish truly did believe they could steal the British territory. I don't think they did. You just you look at it, several small army. What were they really trying to just to stir up noise to get attention? Mm -hmm. I ha I think so. Maybe they were there going were up against the biggest empire of its time. Yes, but also the biggest empire was like their version was Canada. Like it was on. Like we kind of have to bring it back to the time Canada barely had its own army at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Relations with America and British North America were pretty stable, and most of the like conflicts were economic based. They weren't military focused, right? And so there wasn't a need to actually there there wasn't like a felt need to actively defend in terms of a military sense the border of canada it was a relatively porous one so maybe from that sense you can kind of see that there might have been a chance but i really don't know i i can only imagine that it was there mostly to make a dent or to make or to pass a message not to actually like take down the british empire not to actually do something right or perhaps it was for support for those back home in ireland so yeah i i can only assume so but i agree with you it seems very unlikely that if they did believe that they could actually make a difference that you know they that they acted upon it in that way Right. And to be fair, in a sense, they did make a difference, just not in the way that they thought they would or that they proclaimed they would, right? because they made a difference in so far as it impacted the imagination of Canadians on the Americans, right? In a way that I think will inform uh, many projects way past the time that Fenians actually uh, mm -hmm. invaded. Right. Because long after 1871, like I'm talking years after, you still see references to them right? um, in political discourse, in uh, personal writings. Like they, they actually do mark quite a bit of the, the imagination of Canada here. Anyway, anyway. I, Thomas Darcy McGee, which, by the way, wonderfully Irish name. Oh, my God. <laughs> the only way it would be more Irish if he was called Patrick. 
Patty Darcy McGee. Honestly, it, that I don't know if Irish names really do be like that though. No, probably not. But, uh, McGee, yes, like a Mick, sure. No, or, but because like oh. I've, I've, I've the I once knew somebody. Their name was Porter O'Shaughnessy. Mm, their right. name was spelled P A D R A I C. Mm-hmm. Porter. Yeah. So uh, I guess it depends. Right. I assume that's the Gaelic version of Patrick. Probably. Yeah. I just find it really interesting, the pronunciation, the spelling. So it's like sort of saying, oh, the most Irish name or whatever, the yeah. most this and that name is a bit of a false yeah. statement. Have you, uh, what's really interesting, we won't really see it here in the poetry of, of McGee because he doesn't really write like that. But if you look at someone like uh, W.B. Yeats, right, who's a mm-hmm. bit contemporary or a bit after um, McGee, so you'll see sometimes him, you'll see him use occasionally some Irish vernacular or some Gaelic, Irish Gaelic. Mm-hmm. And whenever I read it, it's like, oh, okay, I read this B as a B, right? As I would read it, but it's actually pronounced like a V. And it just melts my mind because I'm not used to seeing anything like that because it's a Latin alphabet, but it's a completely different pronunciation. So I just cry. Anyway, <laughs> Yates. A- Pretty good poet sometimes. Hot take. Hot take. All right. So Thomas Darcy McGee was born in Ireland, um, but he actually moved to the U.S. as early as 1842, where he would actually distinguish himself in journalism. Mm -hmm. He was actually quite well known, uh, and he started a few newspapers in the area. I think, if I remember correctly, he landed in New York, um, as many people do. He would actually return for a bit to Ireland in 1845, where he joined what was called the Young Ireland Movement. Um, And he actually participated in the famous 1848 Rising um, against Great Britain, which was part of a whole slew of revolutions that was happening in Europe at the time. 1848 was like the year in which things were happening. Unfortunately for the Irish, they were just coming out of the potato famine. So their revolution failed hard. Yay! Yep. Oh, wait, no! <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and actually, McGee would get close to one of the more famous Irish uh, nationalists of the time, Daniel O'Connell, right, who was pretty much the leading voice of Irish nationalism at that time. Um, he would actually be brought down by a scandal. Um, Daniel O'Connell had an affair, an extramarital affair, and in highly Catholic Republican <laughs> Ireland, that was a no-go. And so an his career was completely Over. destroyed. Now, but, can you imagine a politician getting destroyed for just one affair? Just, no. They would they wouldn't even make the news. I don't know. 20 years ago, 30 years ago at this point, Bill Clinton was almost impeached. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you we know. Don't, okay, but we don't care about that so much anymore. We don't care about people just having affairs. No, 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 no. Especially not in the European context that Ireland is, right? This country just going to say European context. Yeah, exactly. Affairs just don't matter. It's weird if you're not having affairs. But you laugh, but isn't it in France that it's just like widely known that sometimes the president just sees his mistress sometimes? Like, yeah. I, well, there was a president where he straight up had his mistress live alongside his wife. And it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not even trying anymore. The whole point of a mistress is that you try to hide it. <laughs> anyway. Ah. So McGee participated in the 1848 Rising, it failed, and he was forced to come back to America uh, under the guise of a priest, of all things. Um, And he pretty much started again as a journalist, and he would use his platform to advocate for a Republican revolution in Ireland. So kind of the perfect example of like screaming from afar, like, hey, free Ireland. I ran away, but free Ireland. Hey. All the way from across the water, safely there. Boys, boys, rise up. Risk yep. your lives. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Fight for a free Ireland. Now, obviously, like, say what you will, but, you know, it's either that or he would have been potentially imprisoned by the British in Ireland. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are, there are certain things that you can have kind of take or leave. Depends where I you fall so. on this one. Yeah. And it's kind of funny, right? So in this early, in these early days, right, late 1840s, this figurehead in Canadian Confederation was actually brutally anti-British, right? Very revolutionary and considered himself a quote-unquote traitor to the British crown, right? And he actually advocated full annexation of the British North American territory into America. 
So completely different than what we'd actually imagine a father of the Confederation to be like. Mm -hmm. Right. So he, we, I actually have a quote here from one of his newspaper pieces where he says, quote, the United States of North America must necessarily, in course of time, absorb the northern, pro northern British provinces. A river like the St. Lawrence cannot safely be left in European hands. Either by purchase, conquest, or stipulation, Canada must be yielded by Great Britain to this republic. It's just, it just makes sense. Obviously, right? Um, now, McGee was not the only one advocating for things like this, but it definitely well, shows... Well, I feel like people are still advocating it. There are some, yeah. There are definitely some people that advocate that Canada should be a part of the United States. Either, I, I don't think the revolutionary aspect or violent like conquest aspect really plays a part in it anymore. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, you can definitely see that as being a thing to this day. I do find it kind of interesting, however, this idea that the St. Lawrence cannot be left in European hands. Right? Well, I mean, the I know at least for the bridge, what's the name of the bridge? Which uh, bridge? There are the big bridge. Champlain oh, Bridge? The Champlain Bridge is one of oh, the okay. most used bridges in all of North America and the yes. world. Yes. It's like number two in North America after the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm -hmm. I think it's number one in Canada. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's easily number one in Canada. It's not even yeah. close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the St. Lawrence Port itself is actually a very busy commercial harbor. It is the entry point to Canada for when you're coming in from the Atlantic. Yeah, especially at this time, right? Um, so... It's kind of interesting, though, however, that despite this being an American standpoint, right, saying like we need to annex it into the Republic, there's still this underlying idea that Canada should be something different, mm -hmm. right? Or at least that the colonies that would become known as Canada should be something different. Um, so you still see this kind of idea permeating through already, which I think is kind of interesting. However, M McGee would slowly start on a path that he would continue down until the rest of his life, right, or for the rest of his life, and he would increasingly become not only disillusioned with the U.S., mm -hmm. but become increasingly conservative, right? So starting in 1850, he noticed that there was a lot of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States, and that would kind of push him towards a very conservative form of Catholicism. Um, he had convinced himself that the Irish were better in Canada or that they were better off. They had faced less prejudice in right. Canada, okay. um, especially Irish Catholics. And yeah, it's, he would actually move there in 1857, right? So he came to Montreal a few, about 10 years after having formally settled in the U.S., and he would do what he does once again and start a newspaper, this one called The New Era. And the, I think the year after, in 1858, he would become for the first time a member of parliament for Montreal West, basically, which is basically, as we were saying before recording, where his writing still stands today, right? Uh, the Darcy McGee writing is a provincial writing here in Quebec. And yeah, it holds his name. That's where he was first elected. Very cool. Yeah, it's, by the way, no, the Irish Catholics were not necessarily better off in... Uh, yeah, we're not making that. that claim at all. No, McGee was. <laughs> and actually, he faced a lot of criticism at the time for something like that, for saying for, things like this. For saying that they were better off in yeah. Canada than in Ireland? Mm -hmm. Not um, only from, an, from the Irish diaspora, but um, from the Catholic Church, who were like, look... We have the Orange Order here, which I don't know if you remember us talking about in our Irish, our previous episode uh, on the Irish. Very vaguely, yeah. Right. So basically, they were like a Protestant supremacist group that had a bit of a foothold in Canada. Mm -hmm. So like, look, we face a lot of antagonism, both from government and religious institutions. May not be as overt as in the US, although sometimes it is. But definitely, that's not something that, that that's true, man. <laughs> like, no. chill. Okay, okay, calm down. You're, you're doing fine, for sure. You're doing fine, mm -hmm. but, like, not everybody else. Yeah, but that kind of brings up the, right, so this whole idea of the diasporic nature of the Irish, right, I feel is kind of embodied by McGee, in a sense, right? Not only this movement, but exactly kind of what you're saying. This idea that, you know, he he represented or wanted to represent this ability for the Irish to rise above and to actually succeed uh, right. despite the pitfalls that they were facing in the U S and Canada. Right. Um, and yeah, this actually represented by our first poem, I think that um, one of the first poems that he wrote called freedom's journey. Right. Um, did you read that one actually? 
Uh, yeah, well, I read all the poems you sent forward. Nice. Even, so there was only four of them, and they're not yeah. very long. Yeah, yeah. yeah As exactly. we all know, I prefer the short poems. As one does. Um, actually, next week I was You're thinking. You're gonna have to edit this part out, but I like my poems how I like my woman. Short. I mean, nothing wrong with preferences. That's cool. <laughs> like my men, how I like. I was actually uh, curious what your thoughts were on freedom's journey, right? Because I think it fits perfectly with especially this early uh, idea of the Irish diaspora and how it kind of launches from one place to another. I, I, I think it's good. It, it loses me a bit when it starts using the Africa imagery. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I can def- I, I, I'd i hope at least today Darcy McGee would get some flack for that kind of stuff, trying to sort of draw a comparison between mm-hmm. the, 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 the African situation and Irish people. Yes. Because that seems to be what he's doing. Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, before I forget, yes, the poems will all be online available for free yes. and you can find uh, the collected works of Thomas Darcy McGee uh, in full online. They're in the public domain. They're very good. Yes. So a lot of them are quite good. Not a lot of them talk about Canada per se, but he has like a variety of topics that uh, are quite good. But yes, no, that that's an interesting point. So you're referring specifically in... in Well, first in Freedom. Yeah. Freedom March is the... Freedom's Journey, sorry, is the big one in the second verse. Mm-hmm. She, lodged neath, she lodged neath many a gilded roof that gave her praise in many a hall. Their kindness checked the free reproof her heart dictated to let fall. She heard the Negro's hopeless prayer and felt her home could not be there. She sucked through rich savannas green and in the proud palmetto grove. But where her altar should have been, she found nor liberty nor love. A cloud came over her forehead fair. She found no shrine to freedom there. Yeah. I feel like that was a common comparison to make at the time. Doesn't excuse it, by the way. I I don't think. Like, yes, the Irish uh, suffered greatly um, at the hands of the British in many ways. But I wouldn't exactly compare it to the scramble uh, to colonize Africa uh, and conquer Africa as it was taking place right around the time when he was writing this poem, mm-hmm. right? It, it was like, this is 1850s. Yeah, this is right around the time when European powers are formally taking over in most of inland Africa. There's a lot of directions going on here. So it really mm-hmm. sort of, and again, with Darcy, Darcy McGee's background, so you know he's talking about Ireland, but then you can sort of apply that context everywhere. Yeah. The first line is freedom, a nursling of the North. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and this is when I, did you write this one while he was in Canada or while he was somewhere else? Uh, I believe he was in Canada for this one. It's kind of hard to say because right. the, you the think collected re- poems were, were only released after his death. Right. So you think this sort of idea is it's about him only going back to, it's about Ireland or something, you know, Northern Ireland and going on Southern Ireland and sort of mm-hmm. realizing fighting for freedom there. But then... Where stood her shrine by every hearth, back to the north I will rep- I will repair. The goddess cried, my home is there. Yeah. So then it's sort of, you get more of the idea, well, is he talking about going back up north to Canada then? Yeah, that's that's the way I had, I had read it, right? Mm-hmm. Not just beca- for the purpose of our show, but for me it makes sense because he would spend the latter part of his life where he was actually producing most of his work in Canada, right? Which um, makes the, again, it makes the African-American connections so tenuous at best let's put it that some, way. yeah because you know they're they because you had a lot of them who would be going north trying yeah. to leave these plantations and all that and then almost going south on those trying, it's very sort of the direction and his sort of positioning mm-hmm. seems very complicated in this poem yeah the, there is definitely this almost like you have to he's like because he starts you have to go south to find freedom that's what he's doing mm-hmm. as Absolutely. if there's freedom in the south at the time yeah well that was a fucking lie yeah first of all a it was but also it kind of right like the the directionality is wrong in a sense um that in so far not necessarily wrong but it masks part of the truth because yes you can always make the comparisons with like black loyalists or the underground railroad Mm -hmm. that we've talked about on this show before and that's always the ones that we come back to right as reasons why canada is better than the u.s right because we liberated slaves before but that kind of ignores a whole part of the of the issue and it's the same again Mm. not same but similar with the irish in that putting it in such laudatory terms hides many of the issues that there that were plaguing these communities these non-conforming quote-unquote communities Mm -hmm. um at the time right for the slit for the black people there were still despite the loyalists coming up freely there were still plenty of slaves that were coming up as well like we're just choosing to ignore that you know 
Darcy McGee is pointing to the Irish as going north with, you know, as you say, um, you know, where south the sun superbly shines. So we're bringing southern freedom north with us mm -hmm. right, in this kind of, I, I feel like there's a kind of messianic idea coming through this thing, this kind of movement that's being brought and, um, you know, kind of uh, opening up to this inevitability that mm -hmm. Canada is a greater place. But again, it kind of ignores many of the things that Irish Catholics were facing at the time. There was straight up violence during St. Patrick's Day many times between oh, yeah. different Irish groups, between conven between like formal policymakers and the Irish who considered them barely human in many ways, right? So the, this poem is really well written, but there are some issues. Um, and I think this definitely demonstrates um, where he's coming from. Right. It demonstrates, I think, perfectly this early McGee that uh, that we're kind of this bringing up here. Early McGee. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the rhyme was not intended. I, I do like the last stanza. Uh, uh, which one? Of Freedom's, line, uh, Freedom's uh, Journey. Mm -hmm. Where he says, back to her native scenes she turned, back to the hardy, Martin, kindly, kindly north. north. A little bright aloft, the whole star burned. I went Scottish versus Irish, I think. <laughs> Where stood her shrine by every hearth. Back to the north I will repair. The goddess cried, my home is there. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I don't, my issue is not with his actual yeah. word, blah, 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 wording and poetry and his, his abilities as a writer. Yeah. But he seems like, you really get the the imagery of Darcy McGee and how he changed between, oh, we need to annex Canada for Ireland. Oh, Canada is better than Ireland. Oh, it's this. Mm -hmm. Like, you see, you can get the flip-flop nature of the man very much through his poetry. Yeah, absolutely. And as we'll see with further poems later on, <laughs> this will continue to change. And for me, that's one of the reasons why I think he was interesting to talk about before Confederation. Because for me, he perfectly encapsulates these kinds of changing mentalities as things are going along. Right. Right. And well, just the fact that nobody seems to generally, because that's the that's still one of Canada's main issue. Mm -hmm. Nobody seems to know the general cons consensus of what a Canadian is. Yeah, which some people think is a good thing. Yeah, but... oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's it's nice that we still have a bit of vagueness about who we are because it allows mm -hmm. us to constantly be allowing and accepting new people. Yeah, absolutely. Which is something that McGee will actually bring up. And it's kind of fascinating that it's already so early, despite his conservative nature, that this mm -hmm. is this rhetoric kind of shows through. But uh, I just wanted to bring up, by the way, back to her native scenes, um, like his play on back here, either he's looking back to her native scenes, she turned, or sorry, she, um, and back, as in you're back to something, uh, the hardly kindly north. So to me, this kind of represented um, this diasporic image of the Irish, in a sense, of looking homeward, right, for inspiration on certain things, either the uh, Republican ideal or this, um, you know, what are you fighting for? Republicans and have it. ideals? What? <laughs> Republican, not the party. Uh... Fuck the Republicans. That's pop. That's Historia Canadiana's official stance. If you or at least so. that's his official stance. That's mine. Are you really saying you're pro Republican? Really? No. Oh okay. God, no. But I also know a lot of Republicans. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I grew up in the states for six years. Fair enough. So yeah, we. That was just kind of one poem that I wanted to bring up here. Now I wanted to touch upon right his writing in general. Because his writing would actually keep him going throughout his life, right? Mm -hmm. um, it would be the expression of his thoughts in many ways, shape, or form. And it would be the launching pad for his political career, right? That would cap off his life, basically. So I want to talk about his writing first, uh, just briefly. Um, so he, his, most, his biggest reputation actually today, I would argue, is as a poet. Right. right. Um, more than as a father of confederation, I think if you say confederation to many people, at best they'll bring up two people: Johnny McDonald and uh, what's his name, uh, George Saint Jackson. <laughs> 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 they'll bring trying... up two people: Johnny McDonald and what's his name. <laughs> I was because I I was thinking of Jean... <laughs> I was that, thinking that's of... Canada. That is that is every. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why it's been just. <laughs> You're right, though, because I, I was I was gonna say Jacques Cartier, but then I was like, no, that was three hundred years before <laughs> Georges Etienne Cartier. Yes, this um, the other Cartier. That's I was not just... a statement on Canada. I don't know what is. 
<laughs> but yeah, so that that's pretty much like the two names that come up to most people. But um, you know, McGee, as we'll see, is was a really a driving force of Confederation and other people as well um, throughout other provinces um, or then colonies, soon provinces. But yeah, even though he's kind of now known within poetic spheres or just Canadian uh, spheres as a poet, during his life, he was actually better known as a politician, and he actually only published one collection of verse in his lifetime, which is available for free on Google Play as well. Uh, they have a facsimile. It's called Canadian Ballads and Occasional Verses. Now, Canadian Ballads is interesting because that part is kind of very much focused on like history or at least mm -hmm. McGee's version of history. So he has a poem on Jacques Cartier. He has more than one poem on Jacques Cartier. Uh, one of the poems that I... Wait, Jacques Cartier or Georges Etienne? Jacques. I don't think he wrote on Georges Etienne. He would have been a contemporary. Um, although yeah. he might have. I don't think he did. He wrote uh, another poem that we're going to be talking about later along the line, um, which is about the War of 1812, because everything has to be about the War of 1812. And so he actually does have some Canadian subjects in it, and it kind of opens up, as we'll talk about later, to one of the ideas that he was bringing to Confederation in this idea that you know Canada should have a literature of its own. Um, and one of the ways that he was trying to do that was to bring up Canadian subjects. Mm -hmm. right? So actually, like very few of them do touch upon Canada. Many of them, as we just read, express a very profound love for Ireland. And actually, some of them are very wonderful evocations for his wife. Aww, right? that's they're, so sweet. they're lovely, right? Um, and You're his, lovely. Yes, they're, they're quite... Uh, okay, I'm not lovely, that's fine. <laughs> did you say they're lovely or I'm lovely? I said both, honestly. Oh, you're okay. lovely, you're lovely... I'm sorry, I didn't catch on that. No, no, I'm not lovely. It's fine. I get it. <laughs> You're more than lovely. You're superb. Aww, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but he would write on his wife and eventually his full poems. Which are also write on his wife? That sounds pretty uncomfortable. He wrote on his wife. He wrote about his wife, you mean? Oh. Yes. No, no. Like he put pen and paper on top of his wife. <laughs> no. Okay, I misspoke. You're derailing the whole thing. But yeah, his actual complete work, despite the fact that many of them weren't actually published, they would be collected in full after his death by another Irish poet called Mary Ann Sadler. In terms of his politics, and this is where we'll get into the meat of the conversation and like his increasing, um, the increasing relation with the Fenians that we brought up at the beginning of the episode. Ooh, fun. So yeah. In, right, like I said before, in December of 1857, so not long after he arrived in Canada, McGee was elected to the province of Canada's legislative assembly, right? Um, so basically, he used his newspaper as a launching pad for his ideas, right? Okay. Um, and that's basically, so he established the new era. Not long after, he would basically gain enough traction, both as someone who supported uh, separate schools for Catholics, right, which is a big deal at the time. Mm. He fought against the uh, Protestant Orange Order that we mentioned, and also he would be increasingly against the Fenian movement right, as part of his growing conservatism and um, you know, idealistic idea of Canada, to say the least. And he would obviously, both as a politician and a journalist, become a particularly eloquent supporter of Confederation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is something that I think is very interesting. The idea of the separate schools for Catholics. Oh, um, <laughs> see, I, th this kind of plays into um, to some of the like interesting things um, about politics at the time or mentalities at the time, because I don't think he was going at it from a point of view that the Catholics are separate, right? Or that they're lesser than, and so they need to be segregated. Mm -hmm. Or at least from what I've read of him, that doesn't seem to be the case, right? Because in a way, this was a mentality that permeated throughout. He was doing it to avoid the assimilation of many Catholics, right? And the fact that they are entitled to their own type of education in Canada or in British North America, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a, today we can look at it as kind of a sketchy thing, perhaps, right? This very distinct and separated um, education, but I don't think he was going at it from this perspective. Right? Um, 
Yeah, that's by the way, the Catholic school question would not be solved until long after. Um, <laughs> oh, you know, then we finally decided to make secular churches, but then we had a bigger problem when we made schools, and that was English versus French schooling. Oh, yeah, and that's all a whole of, thing. Oh, yeah, it will we'll certainly get into it eventually, but the, the whole will idea, we? sorry, never mind. <laughs> Did you say will we? Maybe. I guarantee you that we will. We'll at least address the Catholic school question a bit further because, for example, it's going to become a further problem when Manitoba wants mm -hmm. to be a part of confederation or is actively being uh, created for a confederation. Because as we know now, right, the Métis were a huge part. There was a huge French uh, Catholic population in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And so that became a question immediately. Okay, so, you know, similar, but obviously very different to what the U.S. you saw, right, when a new state was created. Is it a slave state? Is it a free state? Similar to that in Manitoba, you saw ideas of, oh, is it a Catholic state? Is it a uh, Protestant English state? What do we do with this weird province that has both. Mm -hmm. And apparently it wasn't good enough to say, well, let it be. <laughs> Just let it be. So obviously it becomes like a whole thing um, when, uh, when you add that. But yeah, so uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention that was very integral to McGee, right, is the thing I was mentioning before is his energetic and eloquent support for confederation. Mm -hmm. That's really something that put him on the map at the time was his ability to express his things in a very, very convincing way. Right. And that's certainly what kind of allowed him to become so popular for a while, because he really was. Mm -hmm. um, he would maintain a strong political foothold until the end of his career, right? Where it would start to slip, namely because of his position on Fenians, right? But especially at the beginning in the 1850s and early 1860s, a big part of what he was doing was saying, look, you know, a lot of these things are good, right? The Catholics, they're all right. We're, uh, he supported minority right. rights, not just of the Irish, but of the French Canadians, right? And he we was don't able we to all need to like kill each other and fight each other all the time, people. Surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> um, surprise, but, yeah. surprise, but we don't actually have to attack each other, but whatever, that's wow. just me. Yeah. And he became really well known for what he called uh, the new nationality. And he would make many speeches upon this, which are also available online. They were collected. Um, and yeah, I can definitely see them as being quite powerful to many people. Mm -hmm. So the new nationality, in short, right? Rem remember, uh, like, try to think if this rings a bell with anything post-Confederation, right? So McGee advocated for Western expansion economic growth right, of Canada to be more on par with the U.S., protective tariffs, a distinctly Canadian literature, and the entrenchment of minority rights, including the French Canadians, so accommodating, uh, namely, French Canadians and the uh... Irish. No word, by the way, of the natives, but that's the whole thing. <laughs> that's, that, that's always the case. You that's have to the assume case. there's never going to be a word about the natives. Yes. Or if it is, it's a very... Derogatory word. Unsavory word. So, yeah. It's kind of interesting, right? That a lot of what he was advocating for is very much what you kind of would see happening uh, in the Confederation project. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to what that uh, what that is, but uh, like how that played out and why he advocated specifically for that, uh, or how people reacted to it. But I think it's interesting to bring up. As I mentioned earlier, McGee would progressively become more and more conservative. And he went from working with George Brown's Reform Party. George mm -hmm. Brown, by the way, I definitely want to bring up during our Confederation talk because he is a fascinating figure. Um, and he would actually go on to the moderates, so a bit more towards the center. And they were led by John Sandfield MacDonald, not to be confused with the person that McGee would eventually end up joining for the rest of his life, John A. MacDonald, with his conservatives. Right. Mm -hmm. He would join him in 1861 and stay with the Conservative Party, uh, basically until his, the, his death. Cool. So it's kind of interesting that this kind of brings up the idea of conservatism in Canada, right? Because we have our very like distinct idea of what it is today, mm -hmm. it's, but it's changed over time. He felt actually constrained, according to him, by the sectarianism of the more liberal parties of Canada. Right, the fact that they were very much entrenched upon no, I'm this and I am that. Right. Okay. Whereas, you know, 
he felt that the conservatives allowed for much more of that malleability with the Irish and the French Canadians. That's well, not to say that this was universal, by the way. <clears throat> Like, well, the base idea of conservatism is everybody should be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm -hmm. And so in, and when that's taken in the right way and it's implemented correctly, everybody can do it. doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. Obviously, mm -hmm. implementation kind of wrecks that. But hey, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of interesting because right, the liberals tended at that time to represent a much more vitriolic stance, for example, towards French Canadians and other things, right? And they right. represented a stance that was much more in line with U.S. annexationist policies, or at least free trade if it wasn't annexation, right? Whereas the conservatives, and again, we'll touch upon that more concretely in our Confederation episodes, where we talk about who the main players are, mm -hmm. tended to be a bit more within the line of you have to fit within a British imperial role and mold, right? So that means that we take the French Canadians and we have to accommodate them or at least force them to progressively become more British. So it's kind of a double-edged sword in this case, right? In which they're advocating for the greatness of the empire while saying, okay, well, yes, these people can join under certain conditions, right? And that's very much where the Irish and French come in and other populations, right? Um, by the way, right, this will work in many ways because the conservative party would be considered and <laughs> it would be considered to be pretty much quote unquote Canada's party for the decades that preceded uh, that, uh, followed confederation. They would basically Fine. be the only party that would be elected aside from a brief four year period <clears throat> in which Alexander's Mackenzie's liberals were uh, in power. And mm -hmm. the only reason that happened was because of a little scandal that we'll get into. Right. But aside from that, the liberals basically for the first 30 years of confederation were the only party. Uh, the conservatives were the only party that was elected in Canada. Okay. Um, and I think a big part of that was because of people like Thomas Darcy McGee who were able to represent this kind of perfect idealistic quote unquote idea of Canada, right? And what the conservatives represented. Mm -hmm. All right. And as we'll discuss in a later episode, McGee would join the Confederation conferences starting in 1864. That would lead up formally to the Confederation talks. He would actually not join the last one because of his waning popularity, which we'll get into. But um, the initial uh, conferences that actually would lay most of the groundwork for Confederation, he would be a part of them. And he would be one of the leading advocates, right? And this is where he said things like, where, you know, he was saying things like, well, you know, my new nationality policy is not mine, right? I'm channeling a moment in huh. a sense. Right. Because people were saying like, oh, this is like some of his critics were saying, OK, well, there's there's a lot wrong with this. Like you're 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 claiming a lot of these things as being a basic Canadian thing. But, you know, a lot of us don't believe that. He's like, look, I'm just channeling what I see around me all the time into a single vision. And it's interesting, I find, that a lot of these ideas would basically be kept, um, or at least even if they weren't followed to a letter, that they would form a lot of the idea of Canada, at right. least going forward. <laughs> So coming back to a bit of the poetry, right? Unless you had anything to say about his political life. No, his political life to me was always secondary. I'm always a bit more interested in the literature that they leave behind. Yeah. And again, I take his political, his political leanings seem to go this way and that way. Mm -hmm. So to me, they don't really hold the most water. Yep. If I'm going to be kind. Yeah, no, but to be honest, that... I think that's one of the things that makes the conservative party at this time very interesting mm -hmm. because it fluctuates radically over time because they understand that by the very nature of their name, conservatives, or as they would later sometimes be known, the progressive conservatives or mm -hmm. Tories, right? They, they actually need to be a bit more flexible in certain regards because or else if they're too rigid, as their name implies, it'll fail. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why they managed to stay in power for so long right? and become known as Canada's party. Okay. So did you, uh, so you read it along the line, right? As well. Yes. Okay. Um, here's another one in which he compares, uh, many things to Africa and Mexico. Um, Oh my God. This one I remember. Oh boy. <sighs> okay. Go for it. Thoughts. Just, just go off King. <laughs> I'm not because it's not my culture and I'm not going to be the one to rage about it. Mm -hmm. But we have never bought or sold Africa's sons with Mexico's gold. Yeah, that's wrong. 
That's just patently false. It's just, yeah, yeah, just, just no. That's just a larger part of the Canadian idea of we're going to take all our problems and shove them under the carpet. Mm -hmm. By the way, the full um, the full stanza is, this is stanza three of Along the Line, 80, yeah. 18, 12. So he says, wealth and pride may rear their crests beyond the line, beyond the line. The bring, they bring no terror to our breasts along the line, along the line. We have never bought or sold Afric's sons with Mexic's gold. Conscience arms the free and bold along the line, along the line. the line. And so it's very obvious that this sort of line is the border between the U.S. and Canada. Yes. I think we can all... Yes, because the context <laughs> is the War of 1812 in this case, by the way. Yeah. Oh, so. God, the War of 1812, because that's never been done to death. Nope. Yeah. He's offering a slightly different perspective, obviously, in this case. Sure he is. Yeah, sure. But, but I, yeah, go ahead. It's just this, because he seems to be very much railing against the, again, he came from America in the first place when he was saying that he needs to annex Canada. Mm -hmm. I just, I can't, his, it's not his poetry itself, because this is actually pretty well written. Yes. He the is, form of, as we've said before, he's a good poet. He's got the talent. Yeah. But what he's trying to say never holds water to me. Mm -hmm. Let the only sword you draw bear the legend of the law, wield it less to strike than awe. You can't say that when you're also sort of part of the Fenians who are leading armed attacks in Canada. Yeah. You can't say, no, 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 it's peace. We have to be peaceful when you're saying like, no, annex Canada. So he would have obviously written this after he came to Canada, so he wouldn't have felt this before uh, by this point. But yes, I, I see your point. I, 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 I understand we mm -hmm. should be allowed to change our opinions. We should be allowed to grow and change and learn new things as people. Yeah. But he seems to very much base his identity and who he is about that. And he doesn't bring any sort of, he never seems to reckon with the fact that he used to believe and think a certain way. And now he thinks a different way. And that's, that's, something, that's something that his detractors would bring up many times. John yeah. A. MacDonald himself, before he joined the Conservative Party, would destroy him on that ground. Oh, damn. Like, you are a, a hypocrite. hypocrite. Like, You're just he, a hypocrite. Yeah, he, he called him out big time on this, by the way, for saying, nice. like, you, you, used to an, you used to advocate for the annexation of Canada, right? And now this was a way for MacDonald to... Um, to basically lambast the Liberal Party or the Reform Party as a whole <laughs> and say, like, look, you're a part of this party, right, who want the same thing with their goddamn free trade agreements and things like this. Like, what is this? <laughs> Very close to just, like, letting loose with that one. Oh. Goddamn. McDonald is a savage in many of his in many of his uh, talks. By the way, we'll get into it when he talks because we're, we're going to dedicate episodes to McDonald. Be sure. Oh, we, we, we want to do like two at the very least, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, but he he did not pull punches with a lot of things. Like I'll give him that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was one of the things that definitely came up about McGee, right? And then obviously he. He shut himself up when he joined when McGee joined the Conservative Party, but that that's another thing. <laughs> that's right, a whole another issue. I, I do see your point, right? I do to come back to that third stanza, right? Mm -hmm. I really I really find that last or pro, before last line to be indicative, right? Conscience arms the free and bold. Right. Yeah. Very much, right? Well, it's kind of funny because he wasn't conscious of what he what was actually going on. Yeah, not just that, or just like ironic. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of coming back to this idea of like advocating for by this point defending Canada against the Fenians, right? Actively, and we'll get into this in talking about his legacy in the last part of the show. But you know, at the same time, saying like, no, our actual like good part is our mental fortitude right and our right. Uh, our moral fortitude if you will right? and, and the is... canadian superiority complex that we've talked about many times oh yeah and this isn't me saying canada is a horrible country no i course. want to make that very very clear because i feel like it can come up it came out that way but we are not a country without our faults no we still have many many issues to deal with and we need to stop looking down on if you want to hear more about this listen to pop canada where we discuss sort of how we are referenced in pop culture this comes up a bit yep excellent plug but yeah that was our latest episode of, of pop canada it was great you know we we anyway no no but you're absolutely right and to me that kind of shows up in a way in the last uh, stanza in the fourth one where he writes steadfast stand and sleepless ward along the line along the line uh, great the treasures that you guard along the line, along the line, by the babes whose sons shall be crowned in far futurity with the laurels of the free, stand your guard along the line. Along the line. 
So there's this weird thing going rolls. on. But it's not weird. It's a very, I think he's very consciously in this sense to come back to this idea of consciousness. Mm -hmm. He's very consciously relating the past because by this point he would have, the, the war of 1812 would have happened almost 60 years before, right? He's very consciously relating past exploits to literal far futurity. Right, this right. Uh, this thing of like this moment and this time in which we're building Canada literally with confederation, right, mm -hmm. is what's building and setting the groundwork on this very line with our conscience and our confidence and our morality, right, without violence, right, the future, right, mm -hmm. in which, by the way, there are kings, right, he's very much relating back to this imperial ideal. He's saying that even the people of Canada will be able to become kings and queens. Well, at the time, it wouldn't have necessarily crossed his mind for queens, <laughs> but uh, for monarchs of Canada. Right? So there is a special place for him in his mind of the future of Canada. And I think this is why I wanted to bring up this poem in particular, mm -hmm. because I think it represents very much what he's trying to do, right? Build a future based on the past. Okay. Um, or based on an idealized version of the past. And I think even when he was a Republican, that came up because as we see time and time again with nationalistic movements, mm -hmm. right, whether they're armed revolutions like the Irish did or whether they're any kind of nationalist movement, like, for example, you saw here in the 60s and 70s, right? It relies on past glory that is invented, right? And so that seems to be rather consistent in his line of thought. Right? How it mm -hmm. takes place, however, is up to debate <laughs> and is very much um is very much uh subject to discussion but i think that's at least consistent in his in his thought okay no right, that's just my thought based on my readings of him but uh, of the poetry of the poetry and of a bit of his uh journalism and things like that like, yeah the journalism i haven't looked too much into i relied more on the notes he sort of presented yeah. here yeah if you but, want, by the way, um, there's a really, um, there's what they call a confederation series, which talks entirely about him. It's like a 45 page document that summarizes his life. And it has a lot of uh, excerpts from his journalism. Uh, right. Which I think are interesting. Um, but yeah, the, did you have anything that you wanted to add about, um, about, the, about the actual poem about along the line? Do you do see some interesting playing with form and the nice use of the repetition in the poem? Okay. Things like along the line, then the shift to beyond the line and stand your guard along the line. Mm -hmm. It le it leads to this very sort of war chant, which is what he's going for. Yeah. But as long as soon as you start looking a bit more into what's going on, you're sort of going, oh no. Yeah. Oh but no no. This is it's interesting that you bring that up, right? The idea of the line and the repetition, because it doesn't always show up, right? The one, the two that I brought up and the one that you read uh, with let the sword, uh, let the only sword you draw, right? Mm -hmm. It brings up specifically beyond the line, along the line, stand your guard on the line, but it's not consistent in his stanzas how he uses those exactly. Sometimes some parts are there, some, t some parts are not. I'm thinking about this now, but it's kind of evocative, right, of a back and forth that's happening. So you're going beyond the line, and then you're back to on the line, and then you're holding strong on the line, and then you're beyond the line again. Right? Right. There's very much this push and pull, I feel, that he's alluding to. I don't know if it was intentional, but he's very much alluding to, uh, very much evokes in my mind this idea of a push and pull between, in this case, Canada and the U.S., right, or the British Empire and the U.S., mm -hmm. um, as it would stand in the 1812 context. So yeah, I think, um, and I think that's something that you see um, in his own politics as well, right? Trying to balance those two worlds. Um, he would be an advocate, for example, of rep by pop, which is a much more American or liberal idea of, um, of democracy, but that would obviously never quite shine through. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's a bunch of, I think, things that could be said here. But yeah, I really like that you bring up the... Um, the, the form yeah yeah and it he know he's a man who knows what he's doing in the image that he's trying to evoke it's just it always comes yeah. off as a bit flimsy yeah actually that's something that before his death mcdonald was trying to do right um to give him a bit of a cushier job within the government so oh. that he could actually uh work on his poetry 
because okay. I think the poems kind of worked in a sense almost as propaganda in many ways. Well, this is good um, propaganda. If you want to use yeah. this, you would have to know who Darcy McGee is and sort of have awareness as, of his previous political stances, which mm -hmm. at the time I'm assuming isn't a lot of people. Well, again, he was a very popular orator. Like people. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying more, you know, the because even now we don't really know everything there is to know about our politicians. Let's be honest. For right sure. Now. Yeah, yeah. We don't always we don't always know everything we vote about the people that we do. No. So I'm thinking what's going on right now is he wanted it's good propaganda. Mm -hmm. It is very good propaganda, actually. Again, I don't know how like deliberately <sighs> so it is, right? Insofar as like he wasn't necessarily asked to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it can definitely take on that form in many ways. <laughs> So, okay, just to kind of finish off, right, um, obviously, as usual, if we didn't mention something about Darcy McGee that you wanted to bring up, I'm well, sorry, no. there's only so long, that, there's, there's only so much that we can say. He was a very influential person. It's, where, it's just how it goes with some of these larger figures and larger yeah. events. We just can't hit it all. Plus, it's the nature of the show where we kind of go based on conversation uh, more mm -hmm. than anything else, right? Yeah. Where we does, might touch does the upon conversation it, take us? Yeah, we might touch upon it later when we address Confederation more uh, succinctly. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to finish off on this idea of his legacy. So we've been talking about his politics, his writing, his so on, but like what actual like tangible elements did he provide for, um, you know, Canada? And especially I want to bring back the idea of the Fenians, right? So both of their impacts on confederation. Mm -hmm. So McGee himself is often associated with pushing the basic elements of what would constitute federation. We've talked about this, right? But, you know, one of the things that is very much associated with him as well is by the time the Fenians start attacking in the late 1860s or mid-1860s, he is virulently uh, attacking them, right? Mm -hmm. In his speeches, in Parliament, he is just not having any of it. The man is done. He is super done. And part of this, I think, plays back into his politics in a sense, right? Because... And, you know, a lot of this, he, he, he would be very much against the Fenians, who were Irish Catholics. And a lot of his constituency were Irish Catholic in Montreal, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, to have someone who attacks them on that ground, right, is very much unpopular, right? So yeah. as, as Confederation approaches, right, so in 1866, 67... Darcy McGee's popularity kind of falters. So despite his advancement of many of the ideas, he wouldn't be actually a part of many of the final steps of confederation. Right. And by the way, the reasons why he aided the Fenians was not only because um, it attacked the basic ideas of what he saw as British imperial freedom right, and mm -hmm. the potential for that within the conservative context of Canada, but he also hated secret societies, right? Because they represented... Oh. Uh, because they represented basically this anti-democratic system, um, which he was against, right? He was very much within a dem democratic ideal. Mm -hmm. right? And the idea of a secret society goes against that to him, or went against that, rather. Right? And so that was one of the main sticking points against the Fenians. Not the fact that they were Irish or Catholic, but ex like what they actually represented as a people, mm -hmm. or as a group, rather. Right. And obviously this position also brought tensions with the Catholic Church, right, because of the Catholic element. And so, yeah, so basically by 1866-67, he has the Catholic Church on his back, he has the Irish constituents, and he has the Fenians themselves all actively against him. All this combined makes it so his party kind of pushes him to the side. He's not actively out of it, mm -hmm. but he's not at the forefront anymore. Right. So his ideas are adopted, but his actual person less so. Right. So I keep alluding to his death, right? Because he would actually face Because a, everybody dies. Not only that, but because he would actually face a really untimely demise. Mm -hmm. right? He in 1868, so only a year after Confederation, uh, he would actually be shot in Ottawa. Right. He'd be he shot? Was, yeah. Nice. Yeah, he was assassinated. Um he was assassinated. Damn, we have assassinations in Canada. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So he was an Ottawa and Athenian sympathizer shot him. He, there was actually a bounty on Darcy McGee's head for a while. Um, I'd have to find the image, but I think he was supposed to fetch $2,000. That's not that bad. Which at the time is pretty darn good. 
I don't know how that translates to today, but 2000 bucks is 2000 bucks. For Maybe sure. not worth a life, but um, I don't know. I think it's 2000 American dollars also. So I don't know what that translates to 2021 Canadian dollars. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in 1868, amidst his crumbling career, uh, Darcy McGee would be shot. So one of the things that he was actually criticized for right throughout his life was basically subordinating political and cultural ideals for a personal advantage, right? Okay. That's one of the things that many of his detractors, including Johnny McDonald until he joined him, um, would bring against him, right? Basically the use of the underdog to boost himself. Oh, as if he was an underdog. Yeah, right? Which in a way, at first, certainly, mm -hmm. but... You know, by the by the middle end of his career, at worst, I would have considered him middle class. Right? I wouldn't necessarily consider him underdog, but also I feel like that's an empty criticism. Right. Because who doesn't do that? <laughs> you see that to this day. Yes, in a way, it's it's like hypocritical in a sense, but he's not. He's he's far from being the only one who ever did that. Everyone obviously wants to be the 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 to, to represent the underdog. Top dog. Right. Say so like, if you can do, if I could do it, so can you. Yeah. Okay. But you know. anything you can do, I can do better. Yeah. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Sorry. Right. But you know, it's, I think he, he's interesting because he was consistent in his efforts on behalf of the Irish to kind of bring him to the forefront of the political scene as being an Irish person himself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and like I said, like a lot of his ideas would kind of permeate into the general consciousness right as a coalesced form mm -hmm. as for the fenians themselves right so despite his scathing criticism uh, which would turn many ag against him the idea of the fenians kind of is interesting i feel um because people would kind of react in a similar way or at least many of the political institutions of canada even if not overtly would react in a very similar way as darcy mcgee mm -hmm. right so you know, New Brunswick and Quebec alike, uh, both together brought colonial forces together to stop this quote-unquote American, even though it wasn't quite American, aggression, right? And right around this time, you have the active creation of a purely Canadian army that's starting to be formed. Woohoo! So there's a lot of ideas that are kind of put into place and symbolized by this Fenian invasion. Right. And as an invasion, yo. And as Confederation creeps up, right, with the final debates about it, you know, New Brunswick, for example, which had been the center of attack by Fenians, uh, New Brunswick, which had previously had an anti-Confederation government, right around the time when Fenians are attacking and being pushed back by New Brunswick, guess what kind of government is elected suddenly? <laughs> Very what? much a pro-Confederation one. Right? Bum, bum, bum. So. You know, you see that all across, right? So as much as you were saying that the Fenians are a small, you know, barely an inconvenience to the British Empire. In, whoa, whoa, in whoa. I wanted to say that directly. I was saying more, I was questioning what they hope to accomplish. Right. I mean, in, in America, I would say that they're barely an inconvenience, to be perfectly honest. But, um, you know, it certainly revealed many of the cracks in structural leadership right, mm -hmm. that would kind of force this coalition. And say, like, even if we were able to bring it back, we have to unite as British North Americans um, into this new thing called Canada in case something similar happens again. So in okay. a way, it would be kind of the final salvo that pushed British North America to become Canada. Mm -hmm. right? That's not to say that it is the only thing, but it is, I think, one of the major elements. And despite Darcy McGee's overt criticism of them, Right. I think it's undeniable that, again, his idea on this would very much inform how a lot of people reacted going forward. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to bring up the last few poems. Right. Do it. How about we go and finish off with Carol and the Blind? Right. Okay. Uh, I'd need to be a refresher on what page that one's on. Ooh, on my edition, well, I don't have the same book as you, but uh, you don't. <laughs> hold on, I'll read it out loud. To the cross of Glenfad, the blind bard came, and at the four roads he drew his rein, and stopped his steed <clears throat> and raised his hand to learn from the currents the lie of the land. And, and spoke, spoke he aloud, unconscious that near, his words were caught up by a listening ear, 
The sun's in the south, the noon must be past, and cold on my right comes from the northeast blast. What ho, old friend, will face to the west, for Connet's the quarter the bard loves best. Tis the heart of the land and the stronghold of song, so now for our Connet friends march we along. In and Connaught, he hummed as, he, as on he rode, the heart and the house and the cup overflowed. In Connaught alone does music find the answering feet and the echoing mind. Tis the soul of the soil and the fortress of song. So now, so now for, for our Connor friends, <laughs> march we along. <laughs> yeah. So to me, this is kind of a, even though it's not explicitly about Canada, I think it kind of reveals a lot of the <laughs> Irish influences in Darcy McGee going forward, right? And how he sees the Irish ideals still very much playing a part uh in canada right or mm -hmm. right because he alludes very explicitly to moving west right or looking westward so no matter where you are in this case right whether it's in ireland looking west to canada or in canada itself as an irish person looking west towards expansion towards the future right towards the unsettled untamed land right um as it was then understood um you know there's i think this very much brings up a lot of the ideals together right uh that were um part of his political agenda if you will yeah i think probably this is one of my favorite ones that we've read today just in terms of style and in terms of actual poetry i think this is the better one i can agree with that just because i feel so much more joy and actual excitement in his writing right that it doesn't feel so turgid and dry as a lot of the poetry that we read right there's an actual interest i think in this case um when he's writing mm -hmm. um which kind of brings me to my last question right or one of my last questions so darcy mcgee right we mentioned he's someone who advocated for a purely canadian literature or at least one that was different mm -hmm. and more established do you think, right, with the poems that you read, I know you obviously haven't read all of his poems, neither have I, but do you think he's actively attempting this or do you think he's actually succeeding in moving forward in some regards with these poems compared to some other ones that we've read perhaps in the past? Do I think he's moving forward with his writing? Yeah, yeah. do you think like he's actually, you know, putting into practice what he's advocating for? I think he slowly is. It just, it, he had yeah. to become Canadian first. Yes or he had to become Irish Canadian because before he was talking from a place of just being Irish and now he has to come back from that and sort of talk in this new place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would agree. And I think his later work definitely demonstrates that. Yeah. Because the, like I said, the first two poems, like you said as well, very much what we'd expect. Oh yeah. Talking about the War of 1812, the style, especially in that first one, Freedom's Journey, super basic of Victorian literature. The War of 1812. Right? Um, at best, right, the War of 1812, there was that um, form idea, right, that we were both bringing up. That could maybe be a bit different. Um, but generally speaking, right, I think by the time we reach Caroline the Blind, I think he's really trying something new in terms of actually enjoying and having fun with his poetry and trying something new that he's maybe not done before. So perhaps there's some aesthetic or form-like differences, but generally speaking, I think we're a long way from a purely Canadian um, oh, for sure. We have for sure <laughs> poetry. Are. Whatever that form may take, but it's still very much um, very much British focused and Victorian in nature. <laughs> so I want to bring up right this listener question <laughs> i don't know how well because uh you've as, uh, as you said before right you may be not aware of his full extent but this is actually brought up by craig um who asked when we first did our irish episode right he asked if not for his assassination right in 1868 do you think that darcy mcgee could have become prime minister i think so i think he could have uh to answer your question Craig, i think it would have been a long road and he would have had some it would have been some careful opposition but i think it is a possibility yes yeah. anybody at this point can be prime minister or president of their country or nation mm -hmm. when we have a d-list celebrity and a bad businessman <laughs> anything's possible of course but you know i think you know if if someone like johnny mcdonald could become president and uh, could be prime minister sorry and despite his many many faults and despite the fact that he was blatantly caught in a scandal of corruption and then managed to come back 
I think someone like Darcy McGee would have been able to come back from um, his lack of popularity or his dwindling popularity mm-hmm. um, once the Fenian problem was actually resolved because he was so central to confederation as an ideal, right? And we'll get into specifically the confederation ideas on the next episode that we do, like what specifically informs this, not only uh, from individual standpoints, but from provincial standpoints. Mm -hmm. I I think it'll be interesting to kind of look over what individual provinces bring to the table. But, right, I think... I think he would have been an excellent prime minister and so for, for the time. Right. right. He was an excellent orator. He had ideas that were popular to the people at the time, and he was well-known, right? Um, so, yes, uh, to answer your question, I do believe that he would have been prime minister. Is there anything that you wanted to add to kind of cap us all off? I don't think so. I think, I think it, all sound, it all works out. Sounds good to me. Okay. Well, Mac, why don't you take us away then? All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You can reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns on the Facebook page, through Twitter, and by email. Please let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. It is very important to us. We require a lot of validation and affirmation of our expenditures, what we have done and journeyed out to do. You can support the show through PayPal as a pay what you feel the show is worth and through the affiliate links in the recommended reading page that has been set up. Also, if you want to find some extra perks and ad-free episodes, you can join us on Patreon, including Mm -hmm. our The Sister series, Pop Canada, a much smaller look at at Canada's pop cultural landscape. But as always, this show will remain free and independent, and all of this is just optional. Finally, if you could leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends, it would be much appreciated, especially sharing with your friends. This show has grown unbelievably through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you want to see the latest stats for our show, Mac? Sure. Read it to (laughs) me. It's incredible. So we're we're hitting like surprising international uh, grounds here. So we are on the Apple History podcast charts in four different countries this week. We're in Canada. We're in India, we're in Colombia, and we're in Thailand, right? All within the top 150 or even top 100 at certain points. Weren't we 35 in Thailand? Yes, yes, I think we actually were. Top hold on. 50 in Thailand, people. Top 50. In, uh, 31. Our peak position in Thailand was number 31. That is insane. If, Honestly, I... If we were a musical, we'd be on the top 40 charts on the radio. Yeah, we'd be, yeah, we'd be in the Billboard 200 or whatever it's called. 40s at 40. Awesome stuff. Uh, honestly, thank you very much to everyone for making this show possible. Thank right. you! For next week, Mac, we're <laughs> actually talking, not ne- next week, but next episode, we're actually talking about Confederation. Praise the Lord. So, if anyone wants to send in questions about Confederation as a project, please um, don't. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Um, I'm really excited for this. Um, I have a lot to say about Confederation. And we like Excited Patrick. He's a lot of fun to have around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Excited Mac. I don't know how excited you are about talking about Confederation. We've been teasing it for so long. But yeah, Uh, I'm thinking also of actually doing something different um, with the cultural oh. element, right? Because no. the show is a Bang cultural all. a cultural history of Canada. So sometimes, you know, the easiest thing to actually play with is literature. But I'm thinking of doing something along the lines of paintings um, and actually depicting the images or idealization of Canada at the moment of Confederation and how that permeates through paintings. Of course you are. I don't know how well it'll play on an audio um, format, like a podcast, but I'll think about it. So I feel antagonism in your your voice. (laughs) I'm kidding. Do what makes you happy. No, but honestly... Happy any- Patrick, happy life. And if anyone has any recommendations about cultural items, yeah, send them over. Please do. They're more fun that way. Or Mac, obviously, if you have anything that you want to talk about, about Confederation art. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. Art Art is the, that's the thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yep, yep. Yep. <laughs> A smart of particles. Yay! All right. See you later, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye.